My name is uh, Nate Berkepeck. Um, welcome to the month of May. It's May. Uh, I'm also known by the name of Grand Maester Nate. Um, I'm an expert in Rails magic. Um, I've forged my links at the uh, Old Town Great Citadel. Uh, just kidding. Uh, Rails is not actually magic. Rails does uh, DHH does not actually sacrifice chickens in his backyard to make all of the components work. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about some of that magic today, uh, being the different parts of the Rails framework and uh, how they all fit together when you type Rails new and get this huge magic set of folders and files. What are they all actually doing for you? And can we get rid of all of them and put uh, a Rails application uh, in a tweet? Um, again, my name is Nate Berkepeck. You may have seen my blog online. I blog at natebirkepeck.com. Uh, I also have a course called The Complete Guide to Rails Performance. Normally, talking about performance and Ruby speed is kind of my shtick. Um, that, that is at railspeed.com, that course. Uh, we're not going to really talk about performance today. There is some performance benefits to this talk, which I'll talk about, um, but they're not really the most interesting part. I think what's interesting here is the underlying modularity of, of what Rails can do for you. Um, but first, let's do a little uh, let's do a little word association. Let's, let's let's do a little cycle analysis on all our poor rail develop Rails developer minds here. Um, when I say Rails, what do you think of? Do you think of bloated or lightweight? Uh, when you have a Rails application and uh, it's fifty thousand lines, does it feel a little bit like this? When you think of Rails, do you think well architected or do you think of spaghetti code? Uh, I've heard action controllers described as a crack den of inheritance. <laughs> do you think of object oriented when you think of Rails? Um, there's a Ruby web framework, uh, formerly known as Lotus, now known as Hanami. Uh, I don't know if they still say this in their marketing, but they used to say that Lotus uh, aims to bring back object oriented programming to web development, which left me wondering where did it go? Uh, and who is bringing OOP back? When you think of Rails, do you think of modular or monolithic? Um, there are many people on Stack Overflow who complain about CSRF not working, and the common advice to just, is to just turn off CSRF pr protection. Surely that by itself is proof that people should only turn on this feature when they need it. Uh, presumably whoever wrote this comment also probably thinks that SSL breaks things, and so all of us should just not verify our SSL certificates. Uh, when you think of Rails, do you think of fast or do you think of slow? Uh, does your Rails application sometimes feel like it's going at a bit of a leisurely oh, pace? Oh, wait, wait, what's that sound? Oh, it's a plug. Oh, I wrote a course about fast Rails applications. Oh, it's at railspeed.com. All right, that's, that's all. That's all. I'm going to stop talking about it now. I'm going to stop talking about it now. Railspeed.com. Uh, so my, my thesis here is that although we have a lot of negative mental associations sometimes, I think, with Rails, um, I think it's actually a lightweight, well-architected, and modular framework for creating speedy web applications, but it just doesn't advertise itself that way. Um, and I think a lot of this comes from the way that uh, our BDFL DHH talks about Rails. Um, in his keynote last year at RailsConf 2015, he described uh, Rails as a kind of prepper backpack um, for Doomsday. Like he wanted to be able to rebuild Basecamp by himself uh, if all of the internet you know, went down and he only had Rails left. He wants Rails to be able to do everything uh, and to be able to, to rebuild Basecamp with just everything that comes in Rails out of the box. And that's a very expansive vision. That, that's not like oh, I'm going to do a one-line, a one-file Sinatra app, and like it's going to be cute in blog posts. Like th that sort of vision leads to a very different um, perception of a web framework than what other frameworks um, come to advertise as their simplicity or, or, or whatever like that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Rails can't be simple or can't be lightweight. So what we're going to do in this talk is we're going to take the file structure and the, the, the 
boilerplate that you get from a Rails new command line, uh, and we're gonna basically just hack it all off until we get down to 140 characters. So the first thing we do after we uh, type Rails new is we have to add a controller. Our app has to actually do something. Um, and so I'm gonna add an, a hello world controller which is gonna render hello world in plain text. That's the only thing I'm gonna add to Rails new, right? And I got to add a route for this, obviously, in configroutes.rb, okay? Now, at this point we have 433 lines of code generated by Rails new. Uh, and that spread over 61 unique files. That is a lot. Uh, and so that includes uh, the YAML configuration files generated, all the .rb files, um, the rackup file. Uh, it does not include blank lines or comments. So this is 433 lines that are actually doing things. Um, so that's a lot to, to wrap your head around. Step one is to just delete all the empty folders and files. Um, we get a lot of folders that are generated by rails.new, or rails new, um, that just are empty and they have this git, this dot keep file to like force git to put them into your source control. Um, but these folders are otherwise empty and uh, they're just there to uh, serve as a placeholder. The, rails doesn't need these things to boot up. Uh, it doesn't need empty folders to like start an application. Uh, which seems kind of obvious in retrospect, but um, a lot of people keep these folders around with no intent of ever using them. Um, some of them, the more interesting ones here that we're gonna delete entirely are the entire lib folder, the entire log and temp folders. Log and temp will just be recreated if Rails needs them. Uh, and the entire vendor folder, uh, if we don't, because we're just doing a hello world application, so we don't need uh, assets or whether or not they come from our own app or from some vendor. Uh, we're also gonna delete all the sort of like boilerplate empty files that don't do anything. A lot of these files, especially config initializers, uh, a lot of these are just blank with comments. Uh, there's no actual code in these. They're just comments that tell you, hey, you should think about such and such decision. Go do that. Uh, and a lot of these like application job or application helper are just blank modules that don't do anything either. Uh, they're, they're, sign, they're signposts that say, hey, you should put such and such code here. They don't actually do anything functional. Um, same thing with the public directory. We can delete the entire public directory. Um, the uh, files like 500.html and 404.html, uh, when Rails has a 500 response in the production environment, it will try to show the user 500.html. If that file doesn't exist and you haven't overridden Rails' behavior, uh, it will just render a blank 500 response, which for our little Hello World application is totally fine. So my point here is that empty does not equal worthless. I think this is actually one of the most important things that Rails new does, is create all these empty uh, comment filled files. Uh, because what it does is it creates a common vocabulary. It says, okay, uh, when I come to a new Rails application, I will go to the app models directory to find the model, the domain model. Like I know that that's where most of the business logic is gonna happen, hopefully. Uh, I know that the controllers and all the HTTP related stuff is gonna be in app controllers. Uh, if I'm hacking away in the view and I see like a jQuery plugin, I know that that's probably gonna be in vendor assets JavaScripts. It just gives us this, this common starting place, which, which makes it so easy for any company that works on multiple Rails applications or as consultants like myself um, to go from Rails application to Rails application and say, all right, well, I know pretty much how this is organized because uh, we have like this default organization that we've all sort of agreed upon by using Rails new. Um, we could hash out this problem every time we started a new application, but we don't. Um, I, I didn't really realize how important this was until I started doing more work with JavaScript on the server side. Uh, it's, it's just like a free-for-all. Like every different, um, uh, some frameworks don't even tell you how to organize anything, so you know, if you're using, um, this is especially too, true, it seems to me, in Electron applications, where everyone just sort of has their own folder structure and each app kind of does things their own different way. Um, in Rails, we don't have that problem. Uh, we just all have agreed that, well, we're just gonna not bike shit on this and this is where, how we're gonna organize our applications. Step two is to delete the entire app folder. Um, so some of these are kind of obvious, like if our Hello World application doesn't need assets, so I can just delete application.js, like action cable, uh, I'm a bit of a cord cutter, so uh, I don't use action cable. 
That was a tender love pun. I, it wasn't mine. Uh, don't need CSS. Uh, it's more action cable stuff. Um, the controllers, we're going to inline. So we're going to move the actual controller related stuff that matters into config application.rb. Uh, and we're going to delete uh, all the views and all the models, everything else in app. So the only part of app that we actually care about in a Hello World application is this part, right? The controller. So I'm eliminating application. Uh, I'm eliminating application controller. That's just a common useful pattern uh, to have. You should usually have an application controller um, that has common behavior between all of your uh, controller classes. If you don't, that's fine. You don't need an application controller. Um, and in a one controller application, we definitely don't. Um, so I'm just putting it at, at the bottom of config application.rb. Um, if you, I, I think uh, Xavier Noria's talk, who just talked before me in here, is going to be a really good complement to this talk. If any of this stuff, because I'm going too fast here, is like, well, I don't know why it's in config application.rb. Um, he talks about the entire boot process and when this file gets loaded and why it's important that I moved it here. Um, so if it's anything really confusing, I would watch his talk when that gets, uh, when that gets posted. Uh, step three is delete the entire bin folder. So this one's a little more obvious, I think. The bin folder um, is just full of a couple of useful things uh, that make Rails development easier um, from a developer's perspective. Um, two of these files are just really simple um, like best practices. They don't really do anything. And that's bin update and bin setup. Uh, these are just example scripts that are just intended to say like, hey, successful Rails applications generally have a setup script uh, that set up, sets up a develop environment, like it installs Redis and Postgres and all the weird things that your app needs. And so a new developer should just be able to run bin setup and then Rails server and be done. Uh, that's just a, a, a best practice. Here's an example. So you don't need that file. You can just delete it. Same with bin update, same thing. Then the four other files here, bin spring, bin rake, bin rails, and bin bundle are bin stubs. What are bin stubs? Uh, bin stubs basically just wrap a gem executable in a little bit of environment setup. So usually it means uh, setting up the load path with bundler or whatever. Um, it might set a constant, like it might say, hey, my app lives in such and such a directory. Now load the gem executable. Um, and that's what that's what actually gets run when we type Rails servers. It should be the bin stub that gets run. And in uh, the, if you actually look at bin Rails and bin rake, you'll see they also use uh, Spring. So the bin Rails sets up a new application process with Spring, then does what it would normally go and do anyway. Uh, we don't need these. Um, what we can do instead, because we're just all we want to do is set up a little Hello World server. Uh, is to use config.ru directly and use a command called rackup, uh, which comes with the rack gem. So rackup uh, looks for a config.ru file in the current directory, and then it treats the contents of config.ru as the body of a block uh, inside this code. So it thinks app equals rack builder.new, contents of your config.ru file, and then calls dot to app on it. Um, the config.ru file in a generated Rails new application looks like this. Um, all rackup files, that's .ru rackup, uh, end in run and then some rack compatible application. Um, if you don't know how rack apps work, I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, but that's all you need to know is we have to have a, we're going to call rackup in the current directory instead of Rails server and it's going to execute uh, config.ru directly, which is basically what Rails server was doing anyway, just with a lot of other fancy um, add-ins that we don't need for our little Hello World server. Step four is to start using only what we need of the, the actual functional components that uh, remain at this point. Uh, we're going to, so at the top of every, uh, everyone's config application.rb, you're going to see require Rails all. And what that does is loads up all the different frameworks in Rails. The truth is, is that I think many applications don't actually use all the components uh, of Rails, especially API-only applications um, or very simple ones like the one I'm talking about today, like a Hello World. Um, 
if you actually look at the Rails all file, it looks like this. I think this is the entire the entirety of it. I didn't I didn't cut anything out here. Uh, it literally just loops through all the different uh, framework components of of Rails, requires each of them, and then we're done. So all I've done here is taken that out of a of an array and done it line by line and commented out the parts that we're not going to use. We're literally just going to use Action Controller for this Hello World app. I don't need a database. I don't need Action View, although Action View gets loaded anyway. Uh, Action mailer, I don't need it, not gonna send any email. Uh, don't need active job, definitely don't need action cable, uh, and I don't need sprockets, because I have an API server, so I don't need to uh, serve any assets or have anything to do with assets. Uh, so to do, give you a little history lesson on, on even why this is possible, um, a gentleman named Yehuda Katz, who I think is here, uh, not in this room, I mean, he's, he's here around in Railscan. He's there, hey, Yehuda! So, uh, wow, okay, so this is the second time I've talked about someone's framework in front of them. Uh, so in 2008, um, Merb merged with Rails. Um, Yehuda sacrificed his web framework at the altar of Rails. Um, and w at the time he had said, uh, Rails will become more modular, starting with the Rails core, and including the ability to opt in or out of specific components. This was sort of like a hallmark of MERB. You couldn't do this stuff in Rails 2. Um, it wasn't the, this modular structure that we have today, but that was the way MERB worked. So when we merged MERB into Rails to, to, to get to the Rails 3 release, um, that was a big part of the work that was done, was getting these, uh, like extracting these different uh, framework components. Um, now, some people didn't like this, uh, Jeremy Ashkenis, a uh, CoffeeScript author, um, had said on Twitter that all forward progress stalled for nearly two years. It's still slower than Rails 2. Bundler JS is, Bundler is a nightmare, no JS 1. You know, case, case closed. Uh, thankfully, that, that doesn't seem to have been the case in the four years since he said that. Um, but I, I think it is, it is true that Rails 3 wasn't really like a feature release. It was a, it was a release for cleaning the internals, making things easier for plugin authors, and part of why I'm giving this talk is I think a lot of the work that went into Rails 3 and this, this modularity that's been given to us isn't used enough, or, or at least we're not aware of it enough as Rails developers. Um, so know this stuff so that Yehuda's work was not in vain. Uh, so the other thing we're gonna delete here is our gem file. Um, the only thing we need in our Hello World application is just gem Rails. Uh, so we're just gonna get rid of the gem file. Eventually, to get down to tweet size, we're actually gonna have to get rid of bundler, uh, which is annoying, but it does you know, technically work. Um, it's important to know that, that Rails is very conscientious, I think, of, of what goes in the gem file and what goes into you know, the Rails framework itself. And everything in the gem file is very much a suggestion. Uh, none of it is required to get a Rails server working. Um, none of it is like official, you know, shank I guess Turbolinks is officially sanctioned, right? Because it's in the Rails organization or whatever. But none of it is required. You can, you can get rid of all of it if you want. Um, one area like that you, you kind of saw this happen was with, with Action Cable. Uh, someone suggested during the development and the merge, like why don't we just make Action Cable a gem and then put it in the default gem file? But DHH said, I think Action Cable and WebSockets is so important that it needs to be in the main framework. It, it's too important to be just in the gem file. So there's a definite decision being made here about what goes in the framework and what goes in the gem file. And uh, so when you look at that gem file, don't think that anything in there is, is, is something that you have to be using. Uh, we're also gonna dump all of the config files that we don't use anymore, because I just got rid of uh, action cable by not loading it instead of Rails with uh, rails.all or rails slash all. Um, we're not using active record anymore, so I can delete config database.yaml. Uh, we're not using Puma, uh, so I can get rid of Puma.rb, and I'm not using Spring, so I can get rid of Spring.rb. Then at this point, we've got like five files left, and now we just inline everything. So we move five files into one. Uh, there are four very important files here. Again, uh, Xavier's talk is really important here. He talks about why there, there are four different files for all this stuff and why we don't inline them all into one. Um, so we have boot.rb, environment.rb, application.rb, and production.rb, and we're just gonna put all of these in the rackup file. So they're all gonna go into config.ru. And once you do that, it looks like this. So this is what I consider the smallest 
practical Rails application. Um, and we're going to get to tweet stupid length in a minute. Uh, so let's walk through this one line by line, because I think this is important to understand. Uh, we're going to require the rail tie for action controller. Uh, we require the rail tie and not action controller directly because uh, there's some stuff that happens in the rail tie that we want to make sure that uh, actually gets run. We're going to define a application that inherits some Rails application. This is this part right here is exactly the same um, as it is in application.rb. We have to define a secret key. I got rid of secrets.yaml, right? So. Uh, I have to define my secret key as a, as a config point. Um, because this is a toy application, I'm just going to set it to some meaningless string. Um, you obviously have to do that for real in a real application. Um, and then I've inlined uh, config routes.rb inside of my application definition. So normally in, at the top of config routes.rb, I think it says rails.application.routes.draw. So we're just doing that here inside of the application itself. Finally, I've got the controller at the bottom of the file here. And I have to call initialize on Rails application. This runs all the initializers and all the uh, hooks in Rail ties. And finally, uh, every, like I said, every rack of file is going to end in run some rack compatible application. So this is the smallest practical Rails application uh, for all intents and purposes. Yeah, listen to that bell. Oh, take a look at that. Oh my god! Woo! Listen to that horn! It's beautiful, I know. It really is a work of art. But there's a lot happening here. Even though this is like a 10-line Rails application, uh, you're still running, if you, if, even if you just uh, required Rails all at the top, you're running Dozens of initializers, um, tons of features are still in this Rails application, even though it's 10 or 12 lines or whatever. The most, the, where I think you can see this the most is in the middleware stack. So there is a stack of rack middleware that each request passes through before it even gets to your router. Um, there was a talk this morning about rack middleware and more about how that works. Um, all you got to know is basically there are things that wrap your application um, and uh, like that they get are like filters for, for the request. So first, the request goes through this middleware, and then that one, then that one, then that one, and so on and so forth. And at the very bottom here is where uh, we uh, call the router, or it gets passed off to the router. Um, and all these middleware do something. So as some examples here, uh, action dispatch request ID adds a unique ID header to every request. Uh, rack runtime adds a runtime header that says this request took X amount of time. Um, remote IP protects you from IP spoofing attacks. Um, we have cookies and session store. We have the flash uh, middleware that runs the flash hash. Um, and then we have some middleware here at the end for uh, HTTP caching. So all these middleware are all doing things, and you didn't have to configure any of them. They're just the default Rails middleware stack. Uh, some of these can be eliminated now in Rails 5. Um, we have this new config point called uh, API only. If you set this to true, uh, it'll remove the session-based middleware down here. I think it removes some more. Um, it's sort of like the, uh, it's sort of similar to when you call Rails new dash dash API. Like um, one of the things it's going to do is set API only equal to true. Uh, you can also delete middleware um, on your own. So if all of this sort of boilerplate doesn't appeal to you, whoops, uh, all this boilerplate doesn't appeal to you, you can just delete each middleware that you don't, your application doesn't use um, on its own. Now why would you do that? Um, middleware are not free. Uh, each one of these uh, is going to cost some time. It, it's, not, it's not zero. Um, and some of them are going to use some slower features of Ruby, like block.call. Um, and when there's 20 of them here, that does start to add up. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, here's another hidden uh, Rails modularity feature as we're trying to strip down our app even further. Um, there's a little class called Action Controller Metal, which is pretty cool. Um, Action Controller Base inherits from this class, inherits from Action Controller Metal. And all Action Controller Base is, is Action Controller Metal plus a ton of modules, like 50 modules, like, like a ton of modules. Um, these are just some of them, like cookies, 
strong parameters, force SSL, et cetera, et cetera, um, if all these things don't really mean anything to you. That's okay. And it's kind of intended. Um, but if you do feel like you want to dig into how Action Controller Base works a little bit more, if the idea of a thin controller uh, appeals to you, uh, you can inherit directly from Action Controller Metal and build your own controller. Um, so even the render method is actually uh, factored out into its own module. So if you inherit from Action Controller Metal, basically like the only thing you can do is work with the rack response directly and say, okay, the response body is this. Um, you can't even call render at this point. Um, so like this isn't 100% equivalent to our, to our Hello World application because this won't set the correct content type. Um, but uh, you can basically start here and then just start including all the different action controller modules um, that you need for this particular controller. And here's another part where I blow your mind. All controllers are actually just rack apps. Uh, so this is our controller. And we can just run that controller in our rack file as if it was a complete application. Uh, the dot action method uh, takes a symbol which corresponds to an action. And we can run the dot call method on this uh, object that's returned by this. And it's just a, it's just a rack application. Uh, OK, so now we can talk about rack applications. Rack applications, um, rack sits between Rails and your web server. Uh, rack is like the common language that web servers and Rails speak. Uh, this is what allows you to use Pumo, WebRick, Thin, all between, and without having to change any of your code. Because Rails just speaks Rack, and the web server uh, bindings all just speak Rack as well, so that they have like a common interface, right? Uh, and that interface is a Rack application. A Rack application is just an object that responds to call and returns an array of three values. The first one, is the HTTP status code. The second one is a hash. This slide is wrong. It's not an array. The second one is a hash, which is the rack env, uh, or environment hash. And the second one is uh, the body, um, which I think has to respond to the each method. So usually, uh, our responses are going to be uh, arrays, because they have to respond to dot each. Uh, so our, action, our controllers just by themselves are rack applications. Uh, and when the router it, uh, the Rails router is basically working with your Rails application, it, it kind of doesn't know that each endpoint, or, e or you, when you call get hello, hello index, a Rails controller is basically functionally the same to it as any other Rack application, which allows you to do some kind of cool things. Um, you can send routes to Sinatra applications, because Sinatra applications are Rack applications. Um, as far as I know, Hanami slash Lotus is also a Rack application, so you could just mount uh, Lotus application, Hanami applications inside of Rails. You can also route, uh, route directly to Prox, um, which is kind of crazy, um, because they are Rack applications that respond to call, et cetera, et cetera. So which we're gonna use that in a minute. Um, well, we could use that in a minute. We could make our, our Hello World application even simpler, right, by just routing directly to a proc rather than even bothering with a controller. Um, if that action controller metal and all that stuff sounds interesting to you, but like you don't want to start from zero, there's this cool method, and it's kind of hard to read, I'm sorry, it's kind of small. Um, action controller base dot without modules dot each, and then you give it a block. Um, you can basically start with action controller, and it'll give you a list of modules minus the ones you don't want. So we're saying every module in action controller base minus params wrapper and streaming, include all those. So you can kind of start from uh, the mat, like all the action controller base modules instead of starting from zero and including them one at a time. Okay. Uh, finally, when it comes to, to modularity, I, I think it's important to know that not all models need be active record. Uh, you can put anything you want in the models folder, actually. It doesn't have to inherit from active record base. Um, active record base is just a class that, like um, action, con action controller metal, just includes or extends a bunch of other modules. Uh, that's literally it if you look at the base.rb, wherever it is in, in active record code. Um, and it's not any more complicated than that. Um, so whatever is in your models folder, uh, it doesn't have to inherit from active record base. There's tons of cool um, stuff in active model, 
uh, which can make your plain Ruby objects sort of walk and quack like an active record based object, but not actually have to do anything with persistence or a database. Um, so check out Active Model um, for a way of modularizing your Rails applications even further. So like I said, I, I said I was going to talk about the performance story, so here's what it is. Um, if your Rails application is like not doing anything meaningful, or it is an API only application which is not using several of the main components of Rails, uh, if you don't require all the parts of the Rails framework, um, you can save some memory. So if you don't require, for example, sprockets, I think you can save like 10 megabytes of memory per process, which is like not small potatoes. I mean like when that across four processes in a, in a typical um, server, like that adds up a little bit. And if you start getting, uh, getting rid of logging middleware, you can save a couple of milliseconds um, per request. So that when I talked about config.middleware.delete, some of those, if you delete half a dozen of them, you can shave some milliseconds off your, off your um, request time there. Not really that big of a gain, obviously. I mean, most Rails servers are 100 millisecond response times, right? So shaving six milliseconds, 10 milliseconds off, it's probably not a big deal to you unless you're at GitHub scale and like you have an average response time of 50 milliseconds and so that's like 10%, like awesome, great. Um, I think the performance story here is really not as interesting um, as the modularity story and the code organization story. Um, so in general, I just want you to realize that framework code is nowhere near as important as application code. Uh, Rails is not slow. Your application is slow. The way you use Rails is slow. Um, but you're, you're not starting from, uh, from a, you know, a, a five yard, uh, what's, what's the opposite of a head start? Uh, you're, you're not starting at a negative here. Um, you're starting w at the same level that pretty much everyone else is. Um, and it's the application, it's everything that comes after Rails new that makes an application slow. Okay, now the insanity, that's cold golf. Um, so this is the application as we left it last. Um, this is the, sort of the, the smallest practical Rails application that makes any sense. Um, and uh, here is the world's smallest Rails application. Amazing, beautiful. Now here's what it actually is. So this is a uh, shell command. We're gonna call rack up. We're gonna pass rack up a dash r option, uh, which is gonna require a library. We're gonna require action control real tie. And then the dash b option is basically saying, okay, this string is config.ru, it's the same thing. I think dash b actually stands for builder, as in rack builder. And then we're gonna give it a string that's our, like our, conf our config.ru. We're going to run a anonymous class which inherits from Rails application. And then this block here is the body of the class. We still have to set a secret key base. I don't know why, because I'm like not using any secret key base related things like sessions. Uh, here's a little code golf trick. This question mark X is the same thing as quote X quote. It's just one character less. Uh, I think that's, that's only there for historical reasons, because like Ruby 1.8 had this weird thing where like if you did question mark X, it like returned a number, like it returned the ASCII code or whatever, and they couldn't get rid of that, so they made it return a letter instead. Uh, so anyway, it doesn't matter because we just, can, we just want to set config secret key base to like something that makes Rails shut up. Um, it, this is very insecure, don't do this, uh, but this is a toy application, so it's fine. And then we call dot initialize on it to run all the rail ties uh, and set up the, the, the Rails application. And this application doesn't actually do anything. Um, it's 404s as a service uh, because there's no routes. <laughs> so all this Rails application can do is serve empty 404 responses. But it is a Rails application. <laughs> yeah. And it fits in a tweet. You could make it uh, useful, quote, unquote useful, by, by adding routes.draw, you know, uh, to some proc here, but then you would just have an application that, you know, serve 200 responses instead of 404s. <laughs> so is this even practical, Nate? Well, no, not really. Um, there's two practical applications I can think of for Rails applications that fit in a file or, or probably not in a tweet. Um, test suites. 
for gem slash engines. I think plenty of gems uh, need a way to test with a live Rails application. Um, sometimes people just do Rails new inside of their test suite directory, which ends up creating this like huge, you know, 400 line monstrosity, which is longer than their entire test suite. Um, you don't need to do that. You can just use our, our one line uh, Rails application and it's gonna be functionally the same as a real Rails application. Um, so I, we use that technique in the Raven Ruby gem, which I maintain. That's the um, Ruby client for the Sentry error notification service. Um, and I, I think every Rails or every Ruby gem that needs to test against a Rails application should be using a similar approach. Um, and also for API only applications, I'm not the kind of guy that does like uh, single page applications and only uses my my Rails server as like a uh, a back end for my Angular app or or whatever. Uh, but if you are and you're not rendering HTML responses, um, maybe your Rails application doesn't have anything to do with assets and all the assets are handled by Nginx or, or whatever. Um, there's a lot of the, the Rails framework that you cannot load. Um, sprockets and active record are the most important ones as far as memory goes. Um, and uh, not loading those parts of the Rails framework will, will save you some, a little bit of memory. Um, and it will save you some headspace of not having to think about these components being in, in your uh, global namespace. But the reality is, is that most applications need 80% of what Rails provides. And so, you know, when you see Sinatra and Sinatra's like require Sinatra, get uh, slash do and, and all that, and that's really nice. You know, the reality is, is that an application that you get, that you get paid to work on every day uh, is gonna need about 80% or more of, of all these things that get provided for us in the Rails framework. Um, so while it may not win any blog post beauty contests, um, I think the way that Rails New is set up is actually the way that most of us would uh, minimizes the work for the, mo for the majority of applications. Uh, and so Rails is modular, uh, you just maybe never needed it. So your homework today. Uh, try not using Rails slash all in your Rails application. Try loading the parts of the framework that you need. Um, to actually test to see if this makes any difference to you, I suggest using uh, derailed benchmarks. It has a little tool that will help you see how much uh, memory you're using on startup. So when you're not requiring these parts of the framework right, you wanna see that number go down. Um, it's author Richard Stevens right here in the front row. Um, and also, if you're thinking about deleting middleware, to save some response time, uh, you can use Apache Bench, that's A-B, um, to pound your application with a, tons of requests per second and see if it's actually improving uh, those times. Consider Action Controller Metal and um, Active Model. Just take a look at those, those classes um, in the Rails code base and see if there's any way that you can simplify your models uh, or controllers. Maybe you're using all these features that you don't actually need. And then the next time uh, you maybe, maybe the next time you reach for, you would reach for Sinatra. The next time um, you would reach for Cuba or some other simple Ruby framework, try just starting from a one line Rails application and see where that gets you instead. Uh, so this talk is available in the form of a GitHub repo. Um, if I skipped, if, or if I went fast through any parts and you wanna know, okay, how do I get from Rails new to a tweet? It's available here in the form of a commit log. So if you, it'll, this, if you go to Nate Berkebeck slash tweet length on GitHub, um, you can follow the commit log line by line. I've, I've written some really long uh, commit messages about why I did certain things. Uh, it gives a little bit more of the background of it. Um, this presentation and the slides are gonna be available here at Nate Berkebeck slash right, Rails lightweight stack. Uh, actually, that's Rails underscore lightweight underscore stack. Markdown screwed it up there. Um, the, uh, in that repo also, there's a bunch of different one, uh, one file Rails applications and like different, app, uh, different practical uses and like uh, different uh, like API only uses for this kind of stuff. Lots of other resources there. Um, like I said, my, my course is the complete guide to Rails performance. It's available at railspeed.com. Uh, I also have tweeted, I've tweeted the one line Rails, the one tweet Rails application uh, at my Twitter, at Nate Berkebeck. Um, if you want to uh, retweet it there. So thank you very much uh, for your time.